Hey friends, happy Saturday. <laughs> hey, welcome to my YouTube channel. In a moment, I'm gonna continue my series on by every word, but let me do a few quick housekeeping things before we get there. Um, if you're new to my YouTube channel, uh, let me start there. My name is Graham, Graham Jones. I am a, an Anglo-American. We're a small demographic, but we have a cute accent. And uh, so I'm British, live here in the United States, and uh, lead some churches here, travel in ministry, and love Jesus. So you can find more about me at my website, gjm.org below. Uh, again, a few more practicals. If you are new to my YouTube channel, please consider hitting the subscribe button down there. Uh, we'll send a free gift to everybody who does that. Let us know in the comments you've done that and we will uh, message you with a gift. Uh, we also have the notes. I've got the teaching notes uh, from this series here. Uh, those are available at a download uh, free at my website, ggm.org, excuse me, forward slash notes. Uh, lastly, yeah, today's Saturday, so I'm back in the United States. I love America. You know, I love traveling. I love France, where I have a home there, but there's just, I really, I, I actually really enjoy coming back to America. Every time I get off the plane, usually for me it's in Boston, and uh, travel through Massachusetts, through New England, it's like I see America for the first time. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I was in a car in France uh, about two weeks ago with somebody I didn't know, I just met them and uh, they were giving my daughter and I a ride and you know, they were talking about where do we live and I, I said I live in America and she was like, oh, you know, oh, she, in, effect, in effect, this uh, French young lady said, oh, America doesn't interest me and um, you know, I, I just actually said you're missing so much. America is an amazing nation so I'm glad to be here. Uh, lastly, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking in uh, Massachusetts in the morning, Connecticut in the afternoon. I'll be in Sturbridge Worship Center um, at 10 a.m., New England Fellowship at 4 p.m. And I'm going to be speaking tomorrow on uh, being led by the Spirit. Really great message. You, if you can be there in person, planes, trains, and automobiles, if I can do it, you can do it. You can be there in person, love to have you join us. If not, we'll be uh, streaming live on our websites as well. I also have some notes for how to be led by the Spirit tomorrow. But let's jump into this together. So we've been talking for, uh, this is day three now, on uh, a little verse that originally the Lord spoke to Moses in Deuteronomy 8. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, the Lord said, I led you in the desert for three reasons to humble you, to prove you, and to know what was in your heart. And I like to say this, uh, you know, we, we tend to read those from our point of view, through our lens rather than God's. I think number one, I don't think God actually wants to humble us. I think God wants us to humble ourselves. James says, humble yourself. It's, it's the imperative form of the verb, speak, walk, write, humble yourself. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, God will raise you up. Yeah? The plan of God is not that you would be humbled. The plan of God is that you would be lifted up. The whole point, though, is God doesn't want you to lift up yourself. When we lift up ourself, it's called pride. Hmm. And the Bible says God resists the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. So, um, again, the problem isn't the destination. The problem is the means. In Genesis 11, a bunch of people came together at the town of Babel and basically came up with a really great agenda. I think it was actually God's agenda. Everything they said, God wanted to give them in a sense. They said, we will make a name for ourselves. We will uh, be unified. We will, we will reach forward to the heavens. Yeah, and have a, like a generational blessing. It's interesting, God looked down and said, no, nah, and destroyed the thing. One chapter later, God comes to Abram, as he was at the time, and he offers him all the same things. He says, I will make your name great. I will make your descendants like the stars of the, you know, the skies and the sand of the seashore. She she um, in effect, Abraham gets all the things the people in the Tower of Babel wanted, but he gets them by submitting to God. He gets them by, by faith rather than by here's what I did, here's the tower I built, so to speak, by, you know, rather than uh, trying to break his way into heaven, heaven came down and rescued uh, mankind, and yeah, we get to 
Well, heaven comes down to the earth. We get to spend eternity in heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. So sometimes the issue is not um, what we want, but how we want to get it ourselves. Yeah. So uh, the Lord said, I'm going to humble you, prove you or test you, which I'll speak more about tomorrow. And then he said to know what's in your heart. And uh, again, I made the comment, I believe, yesterday that I think God knew what was in the heart. I don't think God was surprised by what was in the heart of the children of Israel as they wandered through the desert. Um, it's interesting, in Hebrews um, 3, I believe it is, it quotes the psalmist. And, and it speaks about the people of Israel in the desert. And the Lord said, this people go astray in the hearts. It's interesting, God didn't say they go astray in the desert. They took a wrong turn. The problem in the desert was not that they were lost geographically. The problem in the desert was they were lost in their hearts. If you'll think about it, in effect, what was happening in the physical world, what was happening geographically in the desert was actually simply a representation of what was really happening in their hearts all the time. So God said, this people, they, they wander, they go astray. They're lost in their hearts, not lost in the desert. He said, I'm gonna humble you prove you, test you, and show you what's in your heart. And the next verse says that you may know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, in Matthew 4, verse 4, and Luke 4, verse 4, uh, Satan comes to Jesus and tempts him, if you will. In a way, it's interesting, but Satan's temptation of Jesus was the same temptation Adam and Eve experienced in the garden. You say, no, one was tempted with a fruit. Jesus was tempted with bread. Jesus wasn't tempted with bread. Jesus, Adam and Eve were not tempted with an apple, with fruit. They were tempted to be their own God. They were tempted to be their own provider. They were tempted to disbelieve the word of God. And Jesus' answer when Satan tempts him is not, wasn't no, I won't turn the stones to bread. It was, it is written. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. <laughs> I love that phrase. Once the, a guy who was like a spiritual father to me, once he was preaching in India years ago in a football stadium. And uh, as he got up to speak, suddenly thousands, you know, 50,000 in the crowd, maybe a thousand people with demons started screaming all over the, the stadium. <laughs> you know, nobody can hear a thing. And, uh, it's like my friend's mind just went blank. What do I do? What do I do? And he suddenly started prophesying. And everything he prophesied was a Bible verse. And he'd say, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he just stood there for two minutes. It is written. It is written. It is written. And suddenly, one by one, all these demons like left or shut up or whatever. And he got to preach the gospel. Yeah, because casting out demons is not enough to set people free. You'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Yeah. Glory. So man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. What I want to do today is just explore with you this idea about the speaking God. Um, we have a speaking God. Hallelujah. We have a speaking God. God loves to speak. Hebrews chapter one, verse one says, God who spoke. God who spoke, you say, oh, Graham, does he still speak? You bet your life he does. But God has spoke in various and different ways. He spoke through the prophets. He spoke when he wrote on the wall at Babylon. He spoke through a donkey. He spoke through a woman. Yeah, that'll mess your theology up, Baptist. Come on, God spoke through all of these different ways, dramatic ways, weird and wonderful ways, simple ways, mysterious ways. And then the writer to the Hebrews says, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has made the heir of all things. Yeah, I love it. A prophet would come along and say, thus says the Lord. Do you know Jesus never said, thus says the Lord? Jesus said, it is written. It is written, it is written, yeah. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And it's so important we know that we have a speaking God. Once years ago, I was in India preaching uh, for about three weeks and I, I wandered one day into a, an idol shop, a little store, like a roadside store that sold idols. 
Now, I'm, I'm not recommending you do that. I was just wondering, I'm like, what's this place? And suddenly I realized where I was in and I, you know, I was about to walk out and the guy, the owner came to me and he said, oh, you know, he saw I was European and probably thought I had more money than I did at the time. And he said, oh, would you like to buy an idol? And I was, oh yeah. And he, he said, we're selling gods here. And I, I spoke to this guy and I started kind of teasing him. And I said, do you have a God that speaks? And he looked at me really puzzled and he said, well, it's possible to order a model where they have a little battery and a voice in or like a, like a Kathy doll, you know, a string at the back. And he said, but I don't have any speaking gods in stock. <laughs> so I told him about my God who speaks. My God doesn't need batteries. Come on, let me say that again. My God doesn't need batteries. My God doesn't need a string. My God won't always say the same thing. Sometimes God will, sometimes if you're gonna live by every word, God is gonna challenge you, God is gonna scare you, God is gonna say things which you won't understand because God doesn't speak to your head, he speaks to your heart. Yeah, God is not looking for clever people, God is looking for wise people who will submit themselves to the word of God. So we have a speaking God. And one of the things I think we need to realize if we're going to live by every word is this principle that when God speaks, God doesn't simply convey information. If I came to you today via this technological means and said, hey, my Bible is black. Well, that's true. I've conveyed information. You've learned something you did not know. If I said I have a, a, um, a blue beanie, here next to me, I, I keep my cameras in beanies. Uh, <clears throat> you, would, you would know something that you had not yet known. When God speaks to you from heaven, from his throne, he doesn't simply convey information, he, he conveys revelation, amen. But his life is in the word, the, the very essence, the very breath of God. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 3.16, excuse me, says all scripture is God breathed. I, I like the French version better than that. It says in French, tout être écriture est soufflé par Dieu. All scripture is God breathed. God has gone. <sighs> and in the same way, when God created Adam and Eve, which we want to come to in a moment, God took this man, formed him out of the dust of the earth and breathed through his nostrils. I don't know whether the Bible clearly defines whether God breathed through God's nostrils or God breathed into man's nostrils or whether it was actually both, but God breathed into this, this clay, this man of clay, and breathed the roha, the Hebrew says, the breath of life, and man became a living being. It's really interesting, Genesis 2, 7, there's a Hebrew translation, the Hebrew Bible, it says, um, God breathed through man's nostrils, and the man became a speaking spirit. So when God speaks, he doesn't simply release information. Oh, we can write down and we can learn. God's word isn't just descriptive. God's word is creative. Again, I'll come back to that in a moment. So John 6, 60, John 6, 63, Jesus says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And what we've got to learn to do is to realize that we've been created in God's image and God's likeness. We were created in God's image. And as that Hebrew version says, we've been created a speaking spirit as well. And we have the privilege. We have the, not maybe the moral right, but as it were, the legal right to speak our own words, to speak things which are not true, to speak words. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. But I believe God wants us to speak his words and that literally our words become spirit, our words become life. Romans 4.17, I have it in the notes there, said that Abraham, like God, as it is written, Romans 4.17, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who Abraham believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not as though they were. Hmm. So God has given us the incredible privilege. We have a speaking God and he's created us to be a speaking people. Yeah. And obviously that's to speak love and affirmation and grace and positivity. I have nothing against those things, but it's a million times more than that. We're supposed to speak the creative word of God everywhere we go.
I love getting up every day and saying, today I'm going to bear fruit for Jesus. Today I'm going to win souls for Jesus. Today I'm going to put these hands of clay, as it were, on people. I'm going to speak to sick bodies and heaven will... Remember that God watches over his word ready to perform it. Your word is forever settled in heaven. Heaven will heal bodies. Heaven will drive cancer out of people. Today I can break the addictions that chemicals can't break off somebody. I can break depression off somebody. Why? With a word from God with a word of life yeah come on two more things today guys but uh, there's a great story in uh, Exodus I want to read a couple of passages here Exodus 17 verse 6 the Lord's speaking to Moses and said behold I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people will drink And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God leads Moses to a rock at Horeb, Mount Horeb, and says, strike the rock. Moses takes his stick, his mat on, if you will, strikes the rock, water gushes out of it. Later on in Numbers 20, near the end of the sejour, if you will, in uh, the desert. In Numbers 20, verse 8, the Lord says to Moses, take the rod, you and your brothers Aaron, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water you shall bring forth water for them out of the rock and the congregation and the beast shall drink so Moses took the rod of the Lord just as the Lord had commanded him Um, and Moses in verse 11 numbers 20 verse 11 Moses lifted up his hands and struck the rock and the water came forth abundantly and the congregation and the beast drank and if you get that first story the Lord says to Moses strike the rock. Moses strikes the rock, water comes out. Secondly, but the Lord says to Moses, speak to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, Moses struck the rock and hey, it worked. So often we are striking the rock when we should be speaking to the rock. I see people do that with their children all the time. And I'm not talking here of physical violence. I'm talking, you know, know, there's something worse than physical violence, verbal violence. Again, both are bad. Okay, I don't want to leave any ambiguity about that but um, I see people striking the church they're in I see people striking the husband and wife again I'm not talking about physically I'm talking about with words of death when God calls us to call those things which are not as though they were really leads you to my my last thought here today but we we should be the prophet over our own life I don't get freaked out by the word prophet. I'm not saying you give yourself some ministry God hasn't given you. Rather, what I am saying is we are called to proclaim words of life, words of heaven. What does a prophet do? God who spoke in various and sundry ways. In a way, the prophet was just a broker. The prophet would come before the people and say, I was with God in the secret place and I've got a word and I now deliver to you that word. My point to you is you don't need a prophet. I'm not against prophets. I prophesy every week, certainly, more than every week. And yet there's something more powerful than hearing from God's word from somebody else. And that's hearing from God's word for yourself. Be the prophet over your own life. Stand over your life. Come on, I challenge you as I finish this lesson today. Sit down, get a journal, get a notepad and pen. Make a list of five things you would like to see changed in your life and I encourage you begin speaking get a word from God for all of those five things maybe your health is not where it should be today maybe your mind is confused or tormented or you're anxious or depressed something like that no no blame no shame no condemnation but every day begin let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich get up every day and say I am blessed whatever I put my hand to do will prosper. The blessing and the favor of God is on my life. Be that prophet over your own life. You know, the word we speak attracts the process of growth within us. Jesus always proclaimed who he was. And every time he proclaimed something, he stepped into the favor that enabled him to possess the thing he had been proclaiming. I believe God wants to call us not simply to pray and ask him to do things, but to proclaim those things over our own life again 
and again and again. Seal up. Boom. Guys, I hope that's been a blessing to you. Again, if you're interested in my notes, I didn't cover everything I need to on this lesson. So go to gjm.org forward slash notes. You can download those there. And uh, hey, I have a new course online as well called the Teaching and Preaching Course. I have it on offer this week for $20, reduced from $60, all about how to teach and preach. That would be a real blessing to you. Thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button. Share this video uh, or podcast if you're listening into the audio. And I'll be back tomorrow. See you soon.